Welcome to the Fi Investors Podcast, helping you achieve financial independence through real estate investing, one episode at a time. We talk about personal finance, mindset, and real estate investing. Whether you're a rookie or looking to scale your portfolio, we're here to provide you with the tactics and actionable steps to achieve your goals. Here are your hosts, Diego Corzo and Ward Mahoney. What is up, guys? Welcome to the Fi Investors Podcast. Today, we have Christian Trujillo, who is a travel hacker. He does drop shipping, different businesses. He's in real estate. So we're going to be talking all about that. You're going to listen to a story of, of what the when a limo picked him up while he was in Greece and how he got to that through travel hacking. So really excited about this this episode. You guys are going to learn a lot. And we also talk about credit uh, on how to build credit and some credit hacks. So this is an informational podcast episode for sure. Now, for anybody that's looking to get started investing in real estate or wanting to learn more about financial independence, if you guys go to keys2fi.com, that is keys2fi.com, we have a seven-day informational email course that will give you different topics, dif different tips on how to get financial independence through the six keys of the things that I have learned by surrounding myself with millionaires and also investing in real estate. So make sure that you check on that six, it's keys2fi.com. And also one thing that will help us a lot is if you guys can give us a rating and review, whether it's iTunes or Spotify. And without further ado, we'll get started. What is up guys? Today we have Christian in the house for the Five Investors Podcast. How are you doing, bro? What's up, Diego? Good. Thank you. How are you? Of course. Yes, dude. Really, really, really happy. Today is Friday. Go going into the weekend. And uh, yeah, lots lots of really good stuff going on. And I know that uh, this is going to be a great podcast. We're going to talk a little bit about your story and everything that you're, that you're working on, uh, but also um, a little bit of your background too, to see how you got started and what you're up to now, uh, the different projects that you have going on, how you are also um, getting, helping people with their credit and travel hacking. That's something that you have helped me a lot. Uh, so I'm excited for this podcast. I'm excited too. Thank you for having me on. Yes, sir. So Christian, we've been friends for about three years now going on because uh, I met you in, I believe it was August or July of 2020. 2020. And then now we are um, three years later and we've been business partners. We're neighbors now here in Austin too. Uh, we have invested in real estate together. And uh, yeah, man, it's been a pleasure to to have you as a friend as a business partner too. And I want the audience to hear a little bit about your story, uh, how you got started. And because you've have the you've had the life that a lot of people have wanted, especially with travel. So uh, so yeah, if you can tell us a little bit of your story and we'll go from there. Yeah, of course. Well a lot of people see on my Instagram of me traveling, flying first class, business class to different countries in Europe or Southeast Asia, South America. Mm -hmm. But little do they know that I was born and raised in a little tiny town uh -huh. that had no traffic lights. Oh, so, man. <laughs> only stop signs. Everybody drives a scooter or their motorcycle up and down the town. They know who you are. If they don't, they'll just ask you about that last name and they'll know who your family is. So they'll oh, figure out who you are. Exactly. And I, at the age of 13, I came to Sacramento, to California, without my family. So I came to my uncle's house. Okay. And my parents to this day are still in Colombia. But I visit them once a year, maybe twice a year. Okay. So as you know, coming to United States without speaking English, without knowing anyone in the area, it mm -hmm. was very hard. I remember my first day going to high school. Mm -hmm. I was a freshman. And when I walked in into like the open area of the high school, it was like in between classes. So like a lot of students were walking around and I was just scared. I was I didn't know who to talk to. I, I didn't know how to speak English. And I saw a lot of guys wearing or having a mohawk. Uh -huh. Back then was popular, the mohawk. And they had like purple hair, green hair. And again, I come from a little town, uh -huh. no traffic lights. And I was like, oh my God, what's going on? You know, like, I don't know what to do. I don't know who to talk to. Um, I was taking two to three English ESL classes my first mm -hmm. two years. Eventually 
moved on to regular English classes, graduated from high school, um, but I came with a visa and the visa mm. expired. Okay. So I became undocumented, you okay. know, and I didn't, have, I didn't have my papers. I wanted to go to college, but I didn't have the support. I didn't know about, you know, maybe getting some loans mm -hmm. or I didn't know what to do, right? So yeah. I did go to community college took some classes, but I, I felt stuck. I felt like I couldn't do much. Mm -hmm. And every time I, I looked at a plane, I was like, wow, I wish I can fly. You know, I want to go somewhere else. But I felt like I didn't have the, the paper mm -hmm. or the paperwork. Yeah. And I feel like it just wasn't the right time. Okay. Dude, so you came here when you were, you said 16? 13. 13. Yeah. So 13 years old and you left your parents. Yes. Like to start... On, on your own. Yeah, with my Man. aunt and my uncle. Man, that is, that's crazy. That is something that, number one, not, not, not many people have gone through that, right? Where, and you're also growing in a small, small town to then not even knowing how long you might see your parents. Mm -hmm. um, how, how long was it until you saw them again? Eight years. Eight years. My yeah. gosh, dude, that is, that is crazy. Um, yeah, that's like the, that whole like immigrant story too, you know, like I came also and, uh, I, I, I've been undocumented, I'm still undocumented from that perspective, but dude, what were, what were the, I mean, like, like as a kid, as a teenager, as, as a teenager, what was that period of time where like, did you ever like, we're in a position where like, why am I doing this? Like, I, I want to go back to my parents. Did you ever face that? Like, hey, like, this is not worth it? Or was, or did you just like, this is what I'm here to do. I don't miss my parents as much. Or what what was that? No, I miss them a lot. And I also miss my friends. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I would just go to the house next door, play some trompo and, you know, these yeah. little games that you play as a kid. And I remember when I came to the States, I brought... Las canicas. Uh huh. I, don't know. The, I think they're called the marbles. 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 Because I was like, okay, I'm gonna play with my neighborhood, with my neighbor. Okay. Neighbor. I never met my neighbor for ten years, and oh I was like, my oh gosh. my god, this is way different. But yeah, there were uh -huh. moments where I wanted to go back. Uh huh. I miss my parents. Back yeah. then, we used to have calling cards. Okay. To, yes. To call oh, back for home. Sure. Yeah, this was back in 2003, uh -huh. 2004. Yeah. So we didn't have WhatsApp. I didn't have mm -hmm. a cell phone. It yeah. was the new technology. And I just, every time I talked to them, they were like, that's your sacrifice, but it's going to pay off eventually. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I know it took about eight years before I saw them again, but it was totally worth it. Dude, eight years. Prop, prop, props to you for that sacrifice. And I know that a lot of uh, a lot of immigrants, right, there's, there's always that sacrifice. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of the day, it goes into that why as to why people are doing it, coming into this country with the American dream or like that goal to achieve that, right? Yes. Um, okay, so then uh, you go to school, you wanted to um, you wanted to work on planes or maybe fly the planes. Yes. Uh, what was that, that transition in, into that? So I wanted to become a pilot. Mm -hmm. It was just one of my dreams because I wanted to travel the world, right? So I was like, okay, what better job than being a pilot? Mm -hmm. So I went to school and then I studied aircraft maintenance. That's the closest I could get to planes, mm -hmm. which is being a mechanic for airplanes. I mean, I knew I didn't have the documents, the green card or citizenship, but I was still going to school and I graduated as a technical degree, mm -hmm. as aircraft maintenance technician. and. When I went to take my exam, I had to have a social security number. I had to have my green card or documents because they do, it's a federal federal job, right? Mm -hmm. Federal Aviation Administration with the FAA. So I felt stuck. I was like, oh man, now what? You know, I went to school, I got this God technical degree, it. but I can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So then you hit that obstacle. What was that, what was that like? Like how 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 did you feel? Because like it's not just hey, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna apply for it, and then that's when you find out. It was more like you took the time to study. You took the time like you you spend a lot of time trying to get to that level, and then you found out. Mm -hmm. How how did you feel when that happened? And yeah, like what was that that situation for you? Well, I was really sad, especially because my grandma, she's a teacher and she always told me, hey, you know, make sure you go to school, you get a good job, something you enjoy, mm -hmm. go to university and, you know, just 
live your life to the fullest. Mm -hmm. So I was going to university or college and I was studying what I wanted to do. But when I was faced with the obstacle, I was like, well, now what do I do? You know, like I'm doing what my parents, my grandma tells me to do, but I can't accomplish what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So I started looking into options, you know, okay, Mm -hmm. like there's only two, two ways for me to become legal, Mm -hmm. right? One of them is if the government provides on top of Amnesty, amnesty, uh-huh, amnesty, amnesty. Yeah. right? Or you know, yeah. getting married and, and getting my documents. Uh-huh. Yeah. So the way I looked at it, it was like playing chess. Okay, uh-huh. what's my next move in mm-hmm. order to you know do what I want to do, which is fly, yeah. become mm-hmm. a pilot. So yeah, I eventually got my green card. Okay. Uh, once I got my green card, I enlisted in the Air Force because I wanted to to get around uh-huh. to be around planes. Uh, but because I wasn't a citizen, I couldn't get any jobs related to like touching planes or, okay. you know, working on them. Dang it. Yeah, so <laughs> like, I was like, okay, well, how close can I yeah. get to the plane? They were like, you can do air transportation, which is loading the cargo in the planes. Dude. So I did that, yeah. Oh my gosh, this is like obstacle. You're almost there, you're almost there, and you're, okay, you're, you're, you are you're have a green card, you have a social, okay. Now you'll have a citizenship. Got yeah. yeah. Okay. But it was a cool experience because, so I enlisted as Air Force Reserve, mm-hmm. uh, working on loading the planes cargo, mm-hmm. air transportation. Okay. When I went to boot camp, they actually gave me my citizenship. Holy yeah, crap. Yeah, it was free and I did it in two months. Wow. Yes. So Maybe I, was I like, need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So, but again, I did it because, not only for that, but mm-hmm. I did it because I wanted to be close to planes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, dang. Okay, so you, you did that and were you doing that? Did it get to the point that you were doing that full time, or how how did that work out? It was only full time during training, so okay. it was like two and a half months in boot camp in okay. San Antonio, Texas. Mm-hmm. Then I went to technical school, and I did the whole training for the job that I was gonna do. Okay. And while in boot camp, that's mm-hmm. when I was like, I don't want to. I never want to do this full time. Uh huh. And I don't know if I can have someone telling tell me what to do all day, every day, Got right? It. And I was like, man, the sergeant, you know, we wake up early morning, we go to sleep and throughout the day, they're telling us what to do, what, uh, when to eat, when to shower, when to study. And it felt like I didn't have freedom. It's kind of mm-hmm. funny because the military is about freedom, but being in boot camp, we have no freedom, right? Mm-hmm. So I was like, I gotta figure it out how to make money online. Mm-hmm. And funny enough, when I went to tech school, I started doing research on how to make money online and I came into selling on eBay. And so mm. there is a system called dropshipping and I started doing that. This back this was back in 2013 mm-hmm. and I sold my first item while in tech school and I made like $3. Okay. Yeah, for me it wasn't about the money that I made, it was mm-hmm. what I was doing. Like I'm far away from home, I'm in the military and I just made $3 from my laptop yes. in 2013. I was like I'm gonna keep doing this. That is awesome. Yeah. Now, what is drop shipping for the audience? Yeah, drop shipping is selling a product that you don't physically have. Okay. So you list pictures. So let's say you sell on Facebook or eBay, Walmart or Amazon, but all of this is virtual, right? So someone is buying these pictures, mm-hmm. technically, right? But then when once you make the sale, you find a vendor you buy the product and you have it shipped directly to the customer. So you don't worry about having a warehouse, you don't worry about shipping labels, you don't worry about having your own tracking or shipping system. It goes directly from the vendor to the customer and you make a percentage on profit or spread. Okay, okay, so then you made your $3 Mm -hmm. and then you're like, okay, this is something that if you do more, you'll be able to make more money, right? Maybe add two more zeros or three more zeros or maybe four more zeros, Yes. right? Uh, Okay, so what happened after that? So while I was in school for the military, I kept learning, right? I kept getting better and better at doing drop shipping. And eventually I hired a coach. It took me about a year because I felt like I was stuck. I was doing about, making about $1,000 a month profit, Mm -hmm. 1,200. But then that's when I hired a coach and he introduced me to having virtual assistants. And I was like, what, what is that? Like, what do you mean virtual assistant? Okay. And he said, well, you can pay someone in the Philippines about 500 bucks a month and they work for you full time. I was like, really, what would they do? Whatever you need them to do, right? Like 
product research, order fulfillment, customer service, anything you want them to do, they'll do for you. So that's what I did. I hired my first virtual assistant and my, my business took off because now it wasn't just me. I had someone in my team and then that person referred me to a family member. So not then it was three of us. So it got to a point where I was making okay money mm -hmm. that I went to Mexico and I lived in Mexico <laughs> for like three to four months. Wow. Yeah. And basically that's when you started also like once you lived in Mexico and stuff like that, because I've seen your Instagram. And mm -hmm. then when I met you too, I like, I saw your Instagram and you're like, this guy's been everywhere. Yeah. So basically living the laptop life. Yes. Basically got you to work while you travel. Now, how many countries have you been to so far? 29. 29 mm -hmm. dude that's freaking awesome uh when i get my green card i'll be able i will i'm gonna go out and travel yes that, that's for sure right now i can't leave the country but i can live through you and all and all of your travel that that you do so that's awesome um dude okay so then so you live four months in uh in mexico and you're like okay this is great i'm making money online and living the life that you want mm -hmm. what happened after that so I realized that I was leaving money on the table because all of the products that I was purchasing, I was using my own money, right? And then again, a different coach, it's all about talking to the right people, having mentors and coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, he told me, why don't you use credit cards? And again, coming from a Latino family, you're like, I don't know about credit cards because I, I don't want to get in depth. You know, I, I think I just want to stick to my own money. Mm -hmm. But I got into the game, into using credit. And I realized that credit cards offer you points or cashback. Mm -hmm. And because I was doing about 150 to 170,000 a month in sales online, that translated into points. Wow. Yes. yes. You're talking about 170,000 points a month. A month. Yes. So I was like, of course, why not? Right. Uh -huh. So I started accumulating so many points. And that's when I got into travel hacking, which is basic, basically using credit card points mm -hmm. to transfer to airlines and different hotels to book your flights or your stays using points. Okay. Dang. And I know we're going to be talking a little bit about that travel hacking too. Uh, but for somebody that doesn't have credit, mm -hmm. right? Can you explain a little bit about credit and your credit score? Because uh, yes. I know that. Uh, so you have spoken a couple of times to the Fine Investors Mastermind. Uh, you've spoken on like we've we've done videos, Zoom calls, and everything on building credit. Can you explain mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Because you're definitely an expert on that. Yes, of course. Thank you. So credit is very very important, especially in the United States. It might not be in our home countries, but in the U.S., we need to have credit to purchase a house, yes. purchase a car, or just to have the ability to use other people's money, or in this case, the bank's money, yes. right? So having a good credit means that you're responsible. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that you're gonna get in debt. It mm -hmm. just need, it needs to be paid every month, hopefully in full. Um, and there are different factors. There's there is five factors that compose your credit score. Okay. The two biggest ones is your payment history that covers 35% of the score. And the second biggest one is your credit utilization. So 35% is the banks wants to make sure they want to know that you're paying on time. If you have one late payment, that can ruin your whole score. Okay. So paying on time is just put them on auto pay. Mm -hmm. And that's going to take care of that. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about it. Just put it on auto pay and you're good. The second one, credit utilization. So banks like to see 30% or less of what they give you to be utilized. So let's say, Diego, you have a $10,000 credit card. Don't go over $3,000. Okay. Because if you go over that, that means you're probably spending too much and they get nervous that you probably won't have enough to pay which is good for them because you pay more interest, but at the end of the day, you might default on the card, right? Mm -hmm. So very important to have a good credit payment history and then credit utilization. If you can keep it under 10%, that would be best. Okay, okay. So then when somebody later though, for example, as they're building, if they decide that they wanna do drop shipping or 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 MS, right? And we'll do, we can talk a little bit about that. Um, how do they make, so, is it smart then when you're gonna get your credit pool to that's when you pay off some cards or should you always have it at 30% utilization? Yeah, so when you get when you first get a credit card, they'll do a hard pool mm -hmm. and that hard pool lasts 
stays there for two years. Okay. So if you're thinking about applying for cards, it's best to apply for multiple cards at the same time. Mm -hmm. That way, two years from now, they're going to fall off. Okay. And they get removed from your credit report. Okay. When you pay off the card, you want to pay that card a couple of weeks before your statement due date. Okay. Yeah. That way, basically, when, when your credit card is due, mm -hmm. what the banks do is they basically take a screenshot of how much you owe and they send it to the bureaus, right? Superior mm -hmm. and Equifax TransUnion. Um, but the bureaus, that payment might not report the same day. So it's going to show as pending. But if you pay before it's due, then by the time it's due, it's going to show as paid Got and it. it's going to look better on your credit. Got it. Got it. Got it. And what are like some, like one or two hacks that you might have for somebody to basically like to increase their credit? Um, Great question. I'm all about hacks. Yes, exactly. And, and the best thing is that you can actually hack the two biggest percentages of the score, which mm -hmm. again are payment history and also credit utilization. And there, you can hack those two by having authorized users. Mm. Yes. So authorized user is like, let's say you're starting, I'm actually doing this with my brother. Okay. He's about awesome. to turn 18. He's got no credit at all, right? Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is I added him as an authorized user to one of my oldest credit card. Heck yeah. And with the highest balance. So now my brother's going to turn 18, no credit, but he's got a line that's eight years old. And it's got a payment of 100% history and $18,000 in credit from what, from just one credit card. Wow. So when he applies for new credit, the banks are going to see that, right? Okay, he's got a card under his brother and he's going to be able to, you know, we're going to approve him. So mm -hmm. that one hack is having someone add you as an authorized user. You will gain their payment history, which is 35% of your score, and also your payment utilization, which is 30%. Um, credit utilization, that's 30%. Yeah. Got it. So make sure that you do it. If you're going to get an authorized user, do it with the person that has actually paying on time and yes. everything. You don't want to go an authorized user and with an uncle that hasn't been paying for no. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you don't want that. Okay. You can also, so let's say you have a $10,000 credit line mm -hmm. and you owe 5000 right? So now you owe 50%. Mm-hmm. A one hack to bring it down to 30% or maybe 20, 25% mm -hmm. is requesting a credit line increase on okay. that specific card. So if you're at 10,000, mm -hmm. 10, call the bank and say, hey, I just moved or I'm planning to make a lot of purchases. Can you please give me a line increase? Okay. You always want to ask for double. So if you're at 10,000, request 20,000. Mm -hmm. So now even though you haven't paid that 5,000 off, your utilization goes down because you have higher credit availability. Got it. Got it. Yeah. You have one more hack for the audience on credit? For, on credit? Yes. Yeah. I mean, those two are the biggest ones, but a lot of people don't know that you can remove inquiries. Okay. Yeah. As long as you don't get approved or as long as those are business inquiries, you can get them removed. Okay. So all you have to do is just call the credit bureau, mm -hmm. TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian mm -hmm. and have them remove it. Now, here's the thing. You want to let them know that you didn't authorize that credit pool. And once they know that they're gonna file a dispute, if you do it with experience in 24 hours, that inquiry is gonna fall off your credit. Got it. Yeah, so quick and simple. You know, if you don't get approved, if it's a business inquiry, you can get them off by calling the credit bureaus and saying that, that you didn't authorize them. Mm, okay, so mm -hmm. that's good to know. That's good to know. Yeah. Uh, all right. So then let's say now that somebody has built their credit, somebody that maybe didn't have credit, now now they have that. What are, when it comes to travel hacking, what are some tips? Because you are the travel hacking king. You have people <laughs> that follow you on Instagram and your IG handles work with Christian. Mm -hmm. But I but I see you on your Instagram and you have people that tag you. I even tag you when I get to like upgrade it to like first class or when I go to the Amex lounges and all of that stuff. Uh, what are like? What are some tips that you can give to people that are looking into travel hacking? And also, what is travel hacking, as we mentioned earlier? Yeah, travel hacking is basically using credit card points mm -hmm. or cashback or miles to cover your expenses on travel. So it could mm -hmm. be flights or it could be hotels. Now, not all credit cards offer the same type of rewards. You have to make sure that you have what it's called transferable points. Okay. So transferable points comes from Amex, from Chase, from Capital One. 
if you have like a Bank of America card or like a Wells Fargo card or like a credit union card, they might give you like cash back or they might give you points, but those points are only redeemable in their portal. You mm -hmm. cannot transfer them, right? But if you have, let's say Amex or you have Chase, mm -hmm. you can transfer Chase points over to the Hyatt and you can stay in an only all inclusive hotel for like 17,000 or 20,000 points for two people. All you can drink, all you can eat. Wow. And the best part is that you actually get sign up bonus points every time you get a new credit card. Mm. So with the Chase Sapphire Preferred, they currently have a $60,000 sign up, 60,000 points uh, when you sign up. Mm -hmm. And you can transfer those points over to a hotel or to an airline and book yourself a nice free getaway or vacation. Mm -hmm. Just get in a credit card. Yeah. Hey, that's awesome. And so what are some cards, like for example, in 2023, what are some cards that you would recommend for somebody that wants to travel to Europe or Asia, for example? I recommend 0% interest rate for 12 month cards or at least nine months. Also no annual fee cards, or if there's an annual fee, like lower annual fee. Mm -hmm. And then also cards that give you the most points. So some of those cards is the Chase Safari Preferred mm -hmm. that will give you a 60,000 sign up bonus points and also give you um, the, the ability to transfer points to partners. Mm -hmm. It does have an annual fee, but it's only $95. Okay. If you own a business like an LOC, go into business credit because business credit cards don't report to your personal. Mm -hmm. So if you owe $5,000 on, on that one business, it's not gonna show when you wanna buy a house, which is great, exactly. right? Now there are like two business credit cards that I suggest, the Chase Inc. Unlimited. That one's got a 75,000 75, points when you sign up, mm -hmm. no annual fee and 0% interest rate for 12 months. Shoot, I might need to get on that one. Yes, 75,000 points is enough to like fly first class or like book like three all-inclusive nights. Yeah. And then there's also the Chase Inc. Cash. So Inc. Unlimited and Inc. Cash, they both have the same kind of reward system. Okay. Very, very similar. And they can be for the business. For the business, yeah. Okay. All you need is an EIN. Okay, thing. And I know you helped me with the... Um, with the Amex one. Yes. And for Amex, one thing that I didn't know until you showed me was that, of course, there's the points and there's a bonus and all that stuff, but there's also different things that come with that. Mm -hmm. You get um, 600, you, you get like $400 on Dell or something like that? Mm -hmm. 400. Four, 400 every six months, right? So you get 200 every six months, 200. 400 a year. Okay, so 200 every six months, yes, as a perk. Mm -hmm. There's other perks, but understand that that card does cost a little bit of money. But it's worth it depending on how on how you're using and how you're using the points and all of that stuff. Yeah, that annual fee is pretty high, it's 695, mm -hmm. but it's the platinum card. It's kind of like having a little status, you know, people are like, oh, dang, he's got the Amex Platinum card. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty cool, but other than just flexing that you have the card, mm -hmm. you get a ton of benefits. Like if you're at the airport, you can go to the airport lounges, you get free food, free drinks for you and someone you bring. Um, you also are able to get priority boarding or like TSA pre-check. Mm -hmm. So like you pay for it with a card and they'll reimburse you yes. for the TSA pre-check. They have that for clear They too. have that for clear and for global entry as mm. well. Um, cool story. So I actually, me and my girlfriend, we went to Mykonos in Greece and we booked our, our hotel through the Amex portal. Mm -hmm. And just because we did that, we got picked up from the airport in a limousine. Wow. Yes. That and we is got like awesome. the best experience. We picked we got picked up in a limo and we got like a free upgrade in the hotel. Like ocean view with a jacuzzi in the front. It was amazing just by using the credit card. Wow. Look at that. Travel hacking for real. Yeah, yeah. dude. Okay. That's awesome. That's awesome. And okay, so that is travel hacking and you just shared that experience, but um and then you've basically used that use those to to travel all over the 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 US and one I mean all over the world sorry mm -hmm. uh but also you've been able to use like you've built um through drop shipping right can you share a little bit more than what what happened next you were making 170,000 or like you were having 
you were adding 170,000 points and all of that stuff uh, every single month. How how did you start to build your dropshipping empire too? Because I know at one point you were made like you were selling over a million dollars through through dropshipping, which is freaking awesome. Yeah. Those were the good times. <laughs> times have changed. Uh -huh. uh, dropshipping is not the same as when I started back in 2013, mm -hmm. 10 years ago. But funny enough, I, I deployed with the military. And mm -hmm. while I was deployed, I was still be able, I was still working on my business, on mm -hmm. my laptop. So when I got back from deployment in 2020, that's mm -hmm. when the pandemic happened. Yes. Right. So pretty much every physical business shut down bringing people to purchasing online, right? Amazon revenue went up and because I was an Amazon seller, my revenue went up. And one of my friends was part of your mastermind back mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. And she she talked to Diego and Felipe about me. Mm -hmm. And that's when we, we connected, right? Yes. So we became people that want to work together because yeah. Felipe and Diego wanted to learn about e-commerce and I wanted to learn about real estate. Exactly. So I was like, let's just trade value. You mm -hmm. know, I'll teach you about e com you teach me about real estate. So we yes. did that. And I always wanted to get into real estate. Like my goal to this day is to own a property to each country that I go to. Yes. And I was like, okay, how do I start? Right, mm -hmm. so we got on a few phone calls, and in less than a year, I was at twenty-three doors. Yes, I was like, "Oh right. my god, that's this is right. insane!" You know, just meeting the right people can take you to the next step in no time. Yes, and yeah. I remember that those those conversations too about helping you getting started into real estate, and the right opportunities came up with the partners and everything. And now uh, we own we own the sixteen unit in Augusta, Georgia. But it's it's really cool to see what happens when you do connect with like minded people because you can be in an industry that you're that you may have no experience in, but with the right people, they open doors, mm -hmm. right? And uh, they open doors to opportunities, and that's basically what happened. It it got to the point that I knew what your unfair advantage was, right? And for everybody here, when they're working with partners, it's very important to know the unfair advantages. Uh, I've definitely have mentioned that in the past in other podcast episodes, but it's basically time, money, your network, and experience, right? So you definitely you leverage our network and our experience. And at, and at that point, right, when we contacted you to become a partner, it's like, hey, do you have money? And you said, yes, we have money to put into this deal. And uh, and then boom, fast forward a few months, we own a 16 unit, so it's really cool. And, uh, and I remember when you told me your goal of the, uh, and this is also what's important about sh like um, sharing your goals with others, because you told me, hey, my goal is to get to 20 doors as fast as I can. And I was like, okay, well, when you tell those people, right, people usually want to help you. So the ones you told me that I'm like, okay, how do I help Christian get to those 20 doors? And it happened that that opportunity with a 16 came up and boom. So, so yeah, so that goes to, to surrounding yourself with people that are like-minded, that do want to, like if they're in, if you want to get into real estate, surround yourself with people into real estate. And, uh, and then of course, then, um, having that unfair advantage that you can partner up. So yes, that's awesome. 100%. Yes. I, got, I got a quick story. Yeah. So when I came back from deployment, right before deploying, I basically turned in my, my lease where I was living in Sacramento. And when I got back, I was staying on my friend's couch Okay. in Sacramento. And so that's when I started doing coaching and I was doing okay. And then I became friends with you guys and I uh -huh. was doing better. And we started investing and we started buying properties and there was a point where I was like with 19 units mm -hmm. combined with my partners, but I was still having roommates. Yes. I was still in my friends. I then got a room with my friend and little did they know that I had all these properties, but I was spending like 500 bucks a month for the room, right? And yes. then people, when I started sharing my, my stories, like, yeah, I got 20, 19 doors going to 23. They were like, oh, why are you living in an apartment with roommates? Uh -huh. and, and for me, it was like, because my goal right now is to get those properties. And when I feel comfortable, I'll get my own house. Mm -hmm. And that's when you call me. Yes, that's right. That? Yes, oh, yes. That was funny. And then, uh, okay, so then, yes, I called you. And then, but now we're neighbors. Yes. Too, right? So can you share a little bit about how that happened? Of course. So 
again, I was living in an apartment with roommates, mm -hmm. and then I made a trip to Colombia. I was in Colombia when you called me, and you were like, hey, Christian, I just bought a house, and I can potentially get you the house next door. Mm -hmm. Do you want it? I was like, sure, why not? Let's do it. And this this was this was back in 2021. Mm -hmm. So I got under contract with the house and my interest rate was 2%. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing, right? Uh -huh. That's like free money with inflation, free yes. money. So the house was getting built, new construction, and I knew by 2022 was gonna be done. So at closing in 2022, the interest rate has already changed. So it went from 2% to 4%, but I was only paying like $435 to get this house. Mm -hmm. That's because I used my VA loan. Exactly. Right? And thanks to you having you as my realtor and like all the knowledge and experience that you shared with me, mm -hmm. I moved in from Sacramento to Austin for less than $500 to a brand new house. That's right. Yes, dude. That, that was awesome. That yeah. was awesome. But it was more like, I was like, Christian, this is, there's a house. I just, I just put mine under contract. You want to be my neighbor. And then boom. So. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so now, um, what are the projects that you're working on? And what is, what's what's up next? So I invested in Tulum, Tulum, Mexico. There's going to be a new development. It's growing. They're building an airport mm -hmm. and El Tren Maya. So I actually invested that with one of the mastermind members. So it's mm -hmm. all about connecting to the right people. And it's going to be done at the end of the year. So that's one of the projects that I have working on. Dude, and I'm awesome. also... I'm in the process of learning about business acquisition okay, or starting new businesses or buying businesses. Yes, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about business acquisition. Yeah, so that was, this is another crazy story. So yes. f since I've been in the military, I have some, some of my Air Force friends and one of them is doing really well, right? I would come over to his place in Long Beach in SoCal and he's got like an oceanfront apartment, super nice, mm -hmm. like a hundred and... 80 degree view of the ocean in the city. And I knew what he did. I just never kind of talked about it, right? He's into construction and he does very well as an employee, which is mm -hmm. the crazy part. So one day we were just talking and he was telling me how he's been doing the same job for the past 23 years and he's making the company so much money. He started when the company had only like three trucks mm -hmm. and now they're out over like 30 something trucks. So he's seen the company growth, but he's kind of tired of doing that, right? Mm -hmm. And then I was like, well, why don't you do your own business? He's like, ah, I just don't know. You know, I, I'm comfortable where I am. You know, I don't know if I can take the, the leap of faith or mm -hmm. make the change. So I was like, let's do it together. You know, I know about businesses, how to operate them. So I can take care of all of the admin side. Mm -hmm. And since you have all the experience and knowledge and expertise with this other business, we just combine our knowledge or our fair advantage and we we do it ourselves. So that's uh, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm in the process. I just got my license to become a contractor and do this business mm. and I'm excited. Yeah, I'm just waiting for the license number and start promoting it. Dude, that is awesome. So you were able to partner up with the right person then now you guys can have a business that will be able to thrive and do all of that. And you guys will do it in California, right? Yes. It will okay. be based in, in Southern California and the LA area. Mm -hmm. um, but my goal eventually is to buy smaller companies that do the same thing, mm -hmm. make it a big company and yeah. potentially have a branch here in Austin mm -hmm. and eventually maybe sell it off or just you know have that legacy that I built that business yeah. with my friend. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's awesome. And with what you mentioned earlier, uh, since now we're talking about businesses and stuff like that, I know at some point what's been the max um, through the company, like through the dropshipping company, right? That you've had. What's been the max of the virtual assistants that you've had? The amount? Oh, I think we got to a point where we were like 112 virtual okay. assistants. So 112 virtual assistants working the whole dropshipping empire. And I know that um, that you've been helping also other people with their own stores be able to sell online and and uh, take advantage of for like the travel hacking and all that stuff uh what's been the um like what are the lessons learned on managing the vas to make sure that that they're doing a good job whether it's showing up on time like that they're producing to a high level um for the whole team as a whole for the team as a whole 
Mm-hmm. My biggest lesson is that it's very hard to manage people. Okay, yes. <laughs> it's very, very hard to tell people what to do and for them to do it. Mm-hmm. I think that's why I like the military. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, when you are at a different rank, you can tell people what to do and they will do it, right? They'll get it done. Yeah. But having employees is like you're like pushing them to do something, especially because they're overseas. Time change and it's different culture, different language. Mm-hmm. It's difficult to manage them. And I would say that one of my biggest takeaway it's positive and negative to hire people that are related to each other. Mm. So when I first started hiring my VAs, that those two VAs that I mentioned, mm-hmm. they decided to quit on me at the same time. Mm. Yes, dude. So I was like, now what? I had, I don't know how many orders, maybe close to 100 orders that I had fulfilled, and it was just me because those two cousins mm-hmm. quit on me. Okay. Yes, so I was <laughs> like... Man. Man, this is no bueno, right? <laughs> so that yeah. that lesson learned from my, my beginning years of hiring people, I mm-hmm. applied it into when I grew to over 100 uh, virtual assistants. I did get referrals, um, but I try not to have too many family members mm-hmm. just because they will cover each other's, right? Yeah. They're like, I would have a manager, but the manager is the cousin or the nephew of someone under them. And they'll say, yeah, he's working, she's working. But in reality, they're not working. Yeah, they're having fun yeah. somewhere else. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, the people, managing the people. And how do you how do you track, I guess, like the things that they need to do? Do you track them in specific software? Like, are, is there any software that you use to to track or to make sure that they're doing their checklist, their everyday tasks? Yeah, so we, we're pretty heavy on spreadsheets, okay. Google Sheets, and because they're live, you know, we can see mm-hmm. what's, what's been done. And we also have a time and management tracking software where they actually clock in and mm-hmm. it tracks their activity of like how many mouse clicks they have or if they go on standby. Um, I had to implement that because it came to a point that I didn't know what they were doing. Okay. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I have to implement this. I'm sorry, guys. This is not micromanaging. It's just to make sure that you guys are actually doing your work, right? Yes. They didn't like it at first. Uh-huh. Not at all. Because, yeah. you know, they were with me for about a year before I implemented that. And then mm. we got into like, okay, now you have to clock in. Now you have to make sure that you're doing work and then clock mm-hmm. out. They were not happy. But it helped the business. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, do you have, um, how have you structured the managers, I guess? And I and I guess for this example will be because you've done it in dropshipping, but what have you seen that works best uh, with managing VAs, right? Um, what's been the, like at what point did you know that you needed to have a manager that will be able to help you out instead of you just leading mm-hmm. from the top? I think one of the biggest takeaways that I've learned is to work for the business, not in the business, right? Mm-hmm. I don't wanna be telling them what to do. I promoted my most experienced VA into the manager, and that's when I had more than five members in my team. So okay. at the sixth member, I made my most experienced, the manager, and the one member managed five. Mm, Just because okay. I wanted to make sure that we still had the same quality control, right? So five wasn't in, wasn't a lot, but it was big enough for someone to manage. Okay. And then again, I hired five more, with one manager. And then we kept growing and growing like that. Okay. And then we, we had, we, so we had like a manager for five members. Mm-hmm. Then we have like an operational manager for three teams or more. And okay. so we had two operations managers, then like the general manager on top that managed the entire company. Okay. And then now, uh, as you've been now, fast forward to like in 2023, 2024, right? Mm-hmm. Your your main sources of income are gonna be then your Amazon business, mm-hmm. right? The dropshipping business. You have the contractor business in LA, and then your real estate. Yes. Right. Anything else to that 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 you're involved with in your circle? I'm doing coaching on travel hacking and credit. Cool. Yeah, so if people need help, maybe with credit repair or travel hacking, we can jump on calls, and I can do do some consulting. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And where can people find you? Because I know there's going to be people that are totally interested in uh, in doing some travel hacking. Uh, where can people find more information or reach out to you? Yeah, they can reach out to me online, IG, probably 
send me a DM. It's probably the best way to get a hold of me. I'll get back to you for sure. And I can show you how you can book your next travel vacation using points in 45 days or less. Yes. And your Instagram is? Work with Christian. Work with Christian. Christian with no H. C-R-I. Okay. Awesome. And you also speak, I mean, of course, you speak Spanish, right? So anybody that um, that you can help too, it can be in English or in Spanish. Claro. So that's awesome. Of that's awesome. Well, Christian, super thankful that you were able to do this, especially in person. Uh, Ward couldn't be with us. Of course, he's taking care of some family stuff over there in Boston, but our thoughts are with you, bro. Um, let's, um, but yeah, as we wrap up, Dude, thank you very much for your time. This has been very informational and I know people are going to be reaching out, asking questions. You're going to inspire them on how to travel hack and all this other stuff. Uh, so definitely people will be reaching out. So uh, cool, Christian. We'll see you on the next one. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Awesome. Take all care. Right, dude. Ciao. Boom. Dude, that was good. It was perfect. Yeah. That is great. Um, I'm going to do the quick intro yeah. here. Yeah, so that we are good and I'm going to be looking at the audience. So, good guys. Oh, we're doing great on time. Thank you for listening to the Fi Investors Podcast. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And share this with a fellow real estate investor who you think would find value in what we do. Until next time. Until next time.